All right, how's everyone doing? Um, so I know this talk was actually supposed to be anatomy of a phishing attack, but that, that presentation, I don't know what I was thinking when I submitted it, uh, was actually designed for non-technical people, for my management staff at my work. Uh, and I think it's too basic, because I mean, it is, I'm assuming you had here, everyone knows what phishing is and what the attack is. So um, I'm actually gonna do a repeat of, my, of a different one, which is more on the phishing forensics part, right? And what happens after the fact. Okay, this talk was originally though supposed to be 40 minutes, so I cut down the slide, so if you start seeing things that may be a little inconsistent, let me know, and I'll, I have cards and stuff at the end, uh, but I, I just, obviously when I go down to 15 minutes, we had to change a few things. Oh. So we had to change a few things. All right, okay, so uh, first off we start talking about is, uh, can we stop these attacks at the gate? This presentation is actually about the forensics, right? Because we all know that we're at one point we are going to be fished, right? If probably today, if not, you know, several times today already, right? But what happens afterwards, right? You know, because we can't stop everything. I mean, has anyone? I'm pretty sure that everyone here at one point has accidentally clicked on a phishing email, okay? All right. So uh, just to kind of re-baseline here, we all know what phishing is. We know the differences between phishing and spear phishing right, or more targeted attacks specific to an employee or a company. Uh, anatomy of a phishing attack, of a spear phishing attack, where we're basically looking at as a target a company, right, uh, how do they find that stuff out? LinkedIn is a wealth of information, right? Uh, following the, the social trail, identifies people they employees by now, who your friends are, they then sit there and create a fake <laughs> recognizable email. Uh, Personalize that email. Try to find out stuff from their page. The email passes the spam filters and arrives at the employee inbox. The email is then opened because they know the sender. A link is attached and opened. And then, of course, the hacker uses a backdoor to steal information. Here's an example of, of course, a phishing email that was sent. Uh, process a wire of 357,000. Uh, this one here wasn't from me, but I've actually fed, uh, Received one of these that was, I thought was a really bad phishing email. And I ended up actually wrestling the FedEx guy for a check as they were trying to get it out the door. Okay. So how do we defend against this? Training, validation, whoop, validation and process. Okay. How is it actually set up? Uh, documents, you know, remember that they're not just always links. There's PDFs and there's Word as well. Hour ahead. So just a couple of examples here of phishing emails. And I think we've, again, we, I think we've all seen what these are. Uh, one of the things that, you know, as we go through this, uh, you know, we all know that when they do use a link, it goes to a CNC server and uh, can be pushed out of the context of the user. Uh, one of the presentations I'll be working on for next year would be to see what happens if we use something like Beef to test our controls. So like, does our carbon black, does our malware actually work? does our SOC aware that these attacks are happening, right? So I'm working on some holistic models right now. All right, okay. We all know this, the user clicks the link, which is obfuscated, and then takes them to a site. Uh, first level, the data stolen, which is typically the website the user gives, and then the IP address of the mail header. Okay. All right, all right. Uh, so when you do get these things, uh, you want the user to save the email as an attachment and then send it to a safe mailbox. You might want to consider one outside of your organization, right? So just in case the malware gets away from you, it's not inside your organization. Uh, I tried that with Gmail. The only problem is then Gmail then, then being Google, stripped out all the evidence. I couldn't do any more analysis. Uh, so you want to try to work on is preserving the email header. Okay. Uh, an example of the email headers that Brandon just went through, right? Uh, one of the tools that I did find that was very useful uh, was a Microsoft mail header, and it's testconnectivity.microsoft.com slash MHA pages. And this is one way that you can actually do is go and look at a email. So if you have something like uh, Outlook Mail or something like that, or and I think it actually used to work now with Gmail, where you can't really see the headers, this tool will tell you the headers, right? What do you do with the email afterwards? You can submit it to Fish Tank. 
Uh, you can run it by OpenDNS, or sorry, fish tanks run by OpenDNS, and there's an API available. So if you do get a phishing link, you can submit it to fish tank, and fish tank will tell you whether it is, but you're also giving back to the community, right? Because if it is a phishing email, they'll add it to their list and try to block it. Now, I'm going to assume that most of us in this room are DIY people, DIY people. We're going to want to do it ourselves. So here are some things that you can do when you uh, build a, if you want to do your own forensics. First off, uh, use a clean machine and a clean network. Do not sit there and build and try to do these forensic analysis from your home network or even from your work network, right? Uh, you know, boot from a USB, make sure that their drive is encrypted. Uh, I always make sure I use a factory image. Don't even use a company image in this case. Uh, clean network, non attributable hotspot. That's one of the things if you ever listen to John Strand, uh, he'll sit there and talk about is go and you buy a hotspot, like a, those type of hotspot. And then uh, what I also do is I download b b proxy suites and I step to the site. So well, this looks like a totally legit site, as you probably know. We click on this. Uh, sorry. When I actually went through this, I brought it through Burp, and I brought it through some certain pieces here. So my first piece here in my captured data was news.yahoo.com was associated in there. Why? Because it could always get through. Uh, came from the Associated Press, was Ebola. And then I'm, I'm going to assume, do you guys have an idea of what this is right here? And what the SQL query ended up doing was trying to find their history, right? So, because you can sit there and you can grab all the user, you can grab the username and you can grab the password, but if you don't know where it belongs to, right, it's not going to help. Or even you could just grab the, pa the username from the Etsy password file, you now have an idea of what sites they're at, right? So you can start looking and, and that's, that's what this person was actually trying to do. Uh, I like to track my information. So, uh, Track it. You can use mind maps. That's one of the tools that I like to use. They're quick. So XMind is one of the big ones out there. Uh, FreeMind's another one out there, but uh, to my knowledge, they haven't done any uh, updates to it for a few years. All right. Alternatively, uh, you can also use Case File by Pantera. These are the same people that also make uh, Maltigo. Right. Uh, so you can go ahead and use Case File. You can draw the relationships. The only issue I found with case file is that it takes a little bit more effort versus a mind map. And a mind map, you can actually map stuff very, very quickly. Uh, with case file, uh, you have to actually put objects in. It's a better tracking method. It gives the deeper results. But if you're like me and you have the memory of a goldfish, you may not be able to remember and track all your information. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is just an example of what case file looks like. Uh, similar to Maltigo. You end up starting off with is building up a site and the same thing. You can sit there and start looking at what email address we have, other websites, etc. So as you sit there and you build this, now you can actually do is use Maltigo to help build this initial framework. However, when you start looking at this, you can see the different sites. Uh, and you can start importing the information into case file. Right. So here's where it is uh, if I start investigating one of the sites that they're trying to go to. Because what I'm trying to do is build and understand not just the one site that the person has, but multiple sites. In the previous case where they were doing the, the forensics, the, the other site, they actually had several different sites to put their malware on. So instead of trying to put all their malware on a single site, they had about 10 sites, all in y.img. Right, so they can get past all, pretty much all the filters. I didn't know whether to be scared of this guy or to applaud him because he, it was actually a very well put together phishing email. All right. Uh, so this is just another um, example of the Maltigo case file. All right. Okay. So what do we do afterwards? What do we end up doing after these pieces here? Let's say that it actually does happen. So there are, of course, we all know there's three major browsers out there, Google Chrome, Mo Mozilla Firefox, and Air Explorer and Edge. Um, I think a lot of people here will use uh, Chrome. 
So there's a tool out there, I did not create this tool, called Hindsight, and it's by Obsidian Forensics. And I found that this tool is great. So if you do actually click on or want to investigate a user that is using Chrome, Hindsight is awesome, right? It's a Python script, uh, includes an exe and a GUI. I always use the, the executable. I like the command line a lot better than the GUI. But you essentially is you download this tool. It's hindsight.pi, and I'm using it, of course, against my own uh, browser here. And in that, what you can end up doing and seeing is you can kind of see is what version of Chrome they're using, how many URL records they have, you know, where they went. You can see essentially their entire history, right? I went ahead and I exported my own stuff out to a uh, Excel spreadsheet. I ended up moving all these things and I can now start pivoting and I can understand what happened to the user, where they went. Because once they clicked on the email, they ended up going out to a lot of different areas. This tool is excellent for that. This also works great if you're doing an internal investigation. Okay. Uh, so this is just another example of, uh, of hindsight. Uh, this is the GUI version. I don't use it a whole lot. Okay. All right. And that is my accelerated talk. Uh, my name is Frank Vianzon. I'm with the uh, Denver OWASP chapter. I'm a senior manager, technical testing, second line of defense, cyber resiliency at a company, financial company. Uh, I think next year we should have a contest to see who can have the longest, most obnoxious official title. So that's what I'm going for. Uh, I am also an instructor at the Arapahoe Community College. I teach Network 2, uh, vulnerability assessment, digital forensics, fundamentals of cybersecurity, and firewalls. Before that, I, was a, I, was, I am a military veteran, U.S. Marine Corps and board member of OWASP. Uh, shameless plug, uh, we are going to have our Snowfrock conference up in Denver on March 5th. So if you're looking for another conference, you happen to be in or around the Denver area, uh, we'd love to have you there. And our CFP opens up November 1st. So thank you.